Father, again, we thank you. We can gather here. We have this beautiful building, dear Lord, that you have given us to use to get in out of the, the rain. Dear Lord, a cool, beautiful place to gather together and to gather around your word, dear Lord, that you have also given us. Thank you, dear Lord, for it. We have it to handle, to hold, to share among ourselves. And we pray now you guide us in it as we look into it and see what it is that the Spirit is saying to your church this morning. Dear Father, I think of these prayer requests, dear Lord. We know you've heard them. Uh, folks that are hurting, undergoing procedures, some recovering, some yet with some procedures to go. Dear Father, so many different needs in our old world today. So we pray this morning as you minister to our hearts by your Holy Spirit, you minister to bodies, dear Lord, for healing and for strength that you might restore them to us, dear Lord, that they can join with us and raise their voices and uh, sing with us as we, as we worship and glorify you. So whatever, dear Lord, the needs so great in our nation, uh, we pray this morning. Pray for our surrounding churches here in this parish of silver here. Pray for their services this morning as well as the gospel would go forth. Dear Father, perhaps perchance that folks might bow their hearts, receive the free gift of salvation, and be saved. Dear Lord, we pray that throughout our country, throughout our world this morning. People would uh, just be still for a little while at some time this day and think about you and turn to you and turn to your word. So guide us now. Without you, we can do nothing. So we thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that we can gather like this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking now at 2 Peter in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, as we've gone through 1 Peter and just introducing now 2 Peter this morning. Title of the message this morning taken from the text is Everything That We Need as it is written there in verse, in verse 3. Now, when we began our study of 1 Peter, I said it was probably written around 63 A.D. 2 Peter was written around 66 A.D. Roughly only three to four years had passed, but the world has been changing quickly. Between 63 A.D. and 66 A.D., when this letter was written, Nero had burned Rome, he had blamed the Christians, he officially issued a decree of persecution against them, the Jews in Jerusalem had begun to revolt against Rome, a revolt that would lead in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., just three or four years after this letter was written. <laughs> These were some interesting times to be a young, new church. And again, remember, this is the first pastor of the first church there in Jerusalem. It is also believed that Peter would be martyred shortly after this letter was written because of that edict of persecution. You might say, again, that these are the last words of this apostle to the church. Now, I want you to imagine a little bit this morning being a young Christian in that first church, which is being scattered. What would that be like? Wondering, Lord, what are you doing? What's, what's going on here? In a world that was changing so fast, kind of like our world today, kind of like the church today. And so he pins this letter to them. Peter had wrote in that first letter about possessing a loving submission like Jesus. A living hope, even in the midst of tough times. Times in which you maybe uh, were mocked, were persecuted for doing good. For following Christ's example of love and submission. He also reminded us about what Jesus was willing to endure for doing good, for his loving submission and submitting to the cross that we might get saved. And the question is posed, then what are we willing to endure if he endured that for us that we might get, be saved? Peter went on to speak of the need, even in these hard times, of unity of living holy lives even in the midst of a decadent, immoral society like Rome. Now in this last letter, 
He writes to strengthen believers as the persecution intensifies. He writes to warn them of a new, even more dangerous attack. Not only is the church being attacked from the outside by the Jews and by the government, but the greatest threat to the church comes from the inside. False teachers. Again, I've told you it's like Satan in 1 Peter. Well, if you can't beat him, how are you gonna, what are you going to do? Join him. Join him. Destruction from within by false teachers. This is a warning then against false teaching. A key verse is found in 2 Peter chapter 2. If I had to pick one, that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the letter. Uh, 2 Peter 2 verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people in the Old Testament. Just like we read in Jeremiah this morning in our liturgical Old Testament reading. But there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Just like those stories you read in the Old Testament of how they invaded and brought the nation of Israel to ruin. They will secretly introduce uh, destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. They don't wear a sign. They don't say, I'm a false prophet. They don't boldly advertise that their teaching is false teaching, secretly, little by little. In fact, I'd submit to you today as teachings that didn't seem that harmful that were introduced into Christianity 40, 45 years ago are a tree full of deceitful evil fruit today because they grew and grew and grew. I guess set a missile on a launch pad and figuring that trajectory you know it, it multiplies exponentially if, if you're off a 64th of an inch on the pad you can miss the moon by hundreds of miles and that's what happens with this secret teaching a little bit with a little twist on it but as the years progress as it multiplies in the church so far from that simplicity that was in Jesus Christ. The next verse uh, in 2 Peter 2, 1 verse 2 says this, Many will follow their ways. Not a few folks are going to follow them. Many. Most. The majority. Many will follow this is a letter of danger, danger, Will Robinson. If you're familiar with the old Lost in Space show and the golden years of black and white TV. Danger, danger. Key word to counter all of this is knowledge. Knowledge is used six times in this little letter. It is the antidote. It is the cure to the false teaching. You got to know the book. That's why I do what I do every Sunday. That's why we have Sunday school classes. You got to know the book. Don't follow teachers. Follow the shepherd. You have to know the book. Proof everything by the word of God passage I've talked to you about before in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. You need to be like the Bereans. Paul says the Bereans were more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and they examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. They didn't believe the apostle Paul because if it ain't in the book it ain't so. They didn't blindly follow a teacher, even if he was probably the greatest teacher that ever was, who wrote most of our New Testament. Wow. 
Let's look at this text then in 2 Peter 1. We're just going to introduce it briefly this morning, verses 1 through 3. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. First of three points this morning is very simply as we have one faith. Simon Peter is servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, a shared faith, a precious faith that was given to all of us. That's what we have in common. Simon Peter. He uses both of his names here, which is interesting. Simon was the name of a fisherman who had denied his Lord. Simon is, is a work in progress. It was Jesus who had changed Simon's name to Peter the Rock in Matthew 16. This is Simon Peter, who the Holy Spirit is still transforming and working in his life, molding and shaking him into that rock that Jesus saw in him. The same Simon who God is, is doing a, a work in his life just like me and you. We are all imperfect works in progress. He simply describes himself as a servant. It's an interesting name here for servant. It's a, certain, a particular kind of servant, a doulos, a bond slave. A bond slave is a slave who was sold into slavery, served his time, and when it came time for him to be set free, he said, I don't want to be free. I want to serve willingly. And they would take an owl and punch a hole in his ear, and it would mark that he was a freed slave who, sla who serves as his, as his, of his own free will. It's the way Jesus wants all of us to serve, not because we have to, or we think it buys us brownie points with God. We can never put God in our debt, but because we love him. Just a bond slave, a free slave, a willing slave. And yet, he adds, and an apostle. Now that word to us we may see as, as a title, but it really wasn't in their day. Apostle means a sent one in the Greek. In the Latin, if you had the Vulgate, which is a Latin translation of this Greek, it would use the word missionary. We get our word missionary from it. An apostle. Uh, is a missionary. Somebody who's sent out on a mission. Peter had been sent on a mission. Go and feed my sheep, he told him three times. Go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. He was a missionary on a mission, a bond slave. Old Simon, who God is shaping into a Peter. He is writing back up a little bit. The folks that founded this church, what were they called? The Mishan for Somling? The Mission Friends. They came to Silver Hill on a mission. Most of them didn't even speak English. Most of them came with a carpet bag. Found their way to Chicago. Found in the newspaper advertising this wonderful place that didn't have any malaria or mosquitoes and the sun shined and it never rained. I remember reading those ads. They're all lies. Real estate hasn't changed a whole lot. They moved down here on a mission to start a Sunday school station, a church. So that the children of the Silver Hill, uh, Silver Hill Settlement, they called it, might have a Christian education. Peter is a missionary on a mission. 
a freed slave, writing to those who he describes. And look here. Those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Not their righteousness. None of us are righteous. It's his righteousness. We don't have any righteousness. The only righteousness we have is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that he put on our account. I've given you that illustration before. This is the, the garment of salvation is called in, in the Old Testament. The robe of righteousness. We have been clothed upon to cover up this oh, sinful man. This is our righteousness. And we have all been given that garment of salvation who put our faith in Him to those who through the righteousness of our God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's a gift. Those who simply with empty open hands received that gift. And of faith as precious as ours. A faith that is precious. I fear this may be part of what's wrong in our world today. Faith isn't counted as a precious thing so much. It's taken for granted. A precious gift of faith, a common faith, given to everyone equally. One faith. One faith. That's what makes us unified. There should be unity, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of them being scattered, because they have all received the same gift of faith. In Ephesians 2.8, for example, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. And why did God design the plan of salvation that way? So that no one can boast. But you know what religion loves to do? Loves to boast about its faith is better than everybody else's faith. My God's better than your God. What we believe is better than what you believe. We're all just a bunch of brain damaged sinners. But we have this common faith that is precious. And we're not to boast because it's a gift that we didn't deserve. How can you boast over something that you didn't deserve? Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, Paul picks up the same subject. Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, that gift, that precious gift that you received. Be completely humble and gentle. That's what Peter just finished teaching in 1 Peter. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing, that is putting up with one another in love. So... How, does it, how do you get along with so many different people, with so many different ideas? Got to put up with one another. The old King James word is be long-suffering. That means we have to suffer some folks for a long, long time. Right? Bearing, putting up with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's work. It's not easy. But you got to do it. Make every effort to maintain that unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, here it is, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There should be unity. There should be oneness. Second point this morning about this, this knowledge, which is this key word used some six times in 2 Peter. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. How? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. He's laying really a foundation for the rest of this epistle. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved gift of God, namely his salvation, namely the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to our account, his work of grace that was given to you and is in you by the Holy Spirit of God. It's interesting, as Peter writes, as Paul as well, as this was a, a, a normal salutation in the early church in many of these letters, grace and peace be yours, or they would close the letter that way. Isn't it interesting that the grace always precedes the peace? 
Because if you haven't received the grace of God, you're not going to have that peace. The way to that shalom is by receiving the precious gift of God as it is a gift of grace. And when you've received that precious gift in that way, there should be shalom, peace. Shalom being the Hebrew of, of, of the Greek word. Peace, a state of overall well-being. And again, it was used a couple different ways. It was a greeting in the early church, and it was also a way of saying goodbye, much like aloha in the Hawaiian language is both hello and goodbye. Peace to you, my brother. Peace be upon you. The reason is we find in this grace that we are loved and that we are cared for. In a dark, cold world, we are covered with God's blanket of love and light. And we can curl up, regardless of what's happening in this old dark world, and be at peace, be at shalom. And not only can we find peace, but part of that finding peace in this knowledge of God is finding purpose for our lives. When we find that grace and partake of it, we know why we're here. We know where we're going. We possess and live into this grace and peace more and more in abundance through, what does it say? Knowledge. Through knowledge. As you study knowledge, the book of Proverbs is a great place to study knowledge. It uses three words. It uses wisdom. Well, wisdom comes from God. You pray and James said, ask for wisdom. Wisdom is that which comes by the Holy Spirit of God as he guides and instructs you. Wisdom comes from God. But knowledge, guess where it comes from? When you study. When you roll up your sleeves and go to work. God does his part. He'll give you the wisdom. But, but you got to do this, the, the work, the, the study, the research. That's where knowledge is what you acquire by your own personal study. The other word in Proverbs is the word understanding. And we're supposed to live lives of understanding. Understanding is very simply when you take the wisdom that God gives you by His Spirit and you take what you have studied, your knowledge, and you put them together and live according to those two things, your understanding. Now I got it. Now I know how to live. Now I know what I'm supposed to do and how to react in those situations. But knowledge is the way to peace, this peace that he's talking about. As we learn about God and as we learn about Jesus our Lord in the Bible, as we daily walk with him in a relationship, and by the way, we really learn a whole lot about ourselves in that relationship. You want a life of grace and peace and abundance? The way you do that is through knowledge, learning about God, learning about Jesus, not just academically or scholastically, but experientially as you walk with him in relationship, which is what you were created for. The knowledge of him as it is revealed through his apostles, like Peter, revealed in his holy word through the prophets. You see, peace comes when we discover purpose and meaning for our lives. That purpose and meaning comes through the knowledge of God, our Creator. Who made me? Why did He make me like this? What happened that I got broken? Can He fix me? What did He call me to do? Why am I here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Where did I come from? Where did I going? What is the end of man? All of those questions come together through our knowledge of God and our Savior in accepting His abundant grace of salvation. And then we are covered over like a blanket with a shalom and a peace. No worries. Our world craves purpose and meaning in their lives. It's like a hunger or a longing thirst that nothing will quite satisfy. Some writers have called it the God-shaped blank. 
taking that from a like those puzzles you buy of a thousand pieces and you try to put it together and there's always one right in the middle missing that ties the whole thing together. That's God. He is that missing piece in people's lives. The God-shaped blank that gives meaning to everything else. A world looking for love, looking for purpose and meaning in all the wrong places. People try to fill that void in their lives in many ways. Careers, business, activity, money in our society, more and more. Whoever has the most toys when he dies wins, right? Except you look at the lives of those people who got all the toys, got all the allocates, had all the success. Some of the most miserable lives you'll ever see because it didn't satisfy. It didn't bring peace. Those who find significance in things and stuff and houses, in relationships, other than that of God and of Jesus Christ. This relationship will save me. Good luck with that. Then there are those who turn to drugs, alcohol, self-destructive habits of every kind, hoping to find some meaning some purpose for their lives. The only way to fill that void is to have peace, regardless of what happens in this old world. A peace that cannot be moved, and that peace comes from a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thirdly, in 2 Peter 1.3, because of that, he tells us you have everything you need. He didn't say you have everything you want. But you got everything you need. His divine power. Power is that word dunamis in the Greek. We get our word dynamite from it. The dynamite of God. Holy Spirit dynamite. Dunamis. Came by the new covenant in Jesus' blood, which was a gift. His divine power has given us everything we need for life. There it is, uh, for life, for godliness, for what that looks like as we learn about our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Through our knowledge, there it is, knowledge, two times in three verses, through our knowledge of Him who called us, and we all have that same calling, by His own likeness or appearance, His own glory, and His own, his own goodness. You see, we were called to be like Jesus. We were called to reflect the glory of God. Martin Luther in his child's catechism for kids, the very first card that you memorized in those days is what is the end of man? You'd flip over that flash card and say to glorify God, which means to show forth the likeness or the appearance of God in your life. God is a God of love. God is good all the time. And when you do good, and when you love, you were reflecting the very image of God. That image that you were created in and that you were meant to shine forth from the beginning. But our forefather, Adam, disobeyed. Decided to live life his own way apart from God. Rejected the commandment of God. Plunged the whole human race into a meaningless existence apart from God. Everything else, God came in His love to restore us to that imageness that we lost in the beginning through sin. His glory, His likeness, love, goodness, forgiveness, compassion, on and on. More and more as we learn about Him that we add to that list. Point being, you already have everything you need. But everything you need uh, is, is, is by the power of the Holy Spirit you possess, if you possess His grace. Having been born again, having entered into His peace by the knowledge of Him, you have everything that you need for faith and life. Again, in 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power, as we put it together, 
has given you everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and his own goodness. Paul puts it this way as he echoes the words of Peter in Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You already have all the blessings. There aren't any more to have. We don't understand that. You already got them all. Everything you need. You already have. But what's the problem? You don't believe it. And you don't live into it by faith. The children of Israel marched up to the promised land. God had parted the sea, brought plagues on Egypt. They had seen his miraculous hand. He marches up to the city and they say, here it is, the promised land. It's all yours. I've given you blessing upon blessing, a land of milk and honey. All you got to do is go in and get it by faith. But he didn't go in and get it. Except for two of them, Joshua and Caleb believed God. The rest of them had to die in the wilderness for 40 years and couldn't enter into those blessings. The same happens today. God has given us everything we need. We already have every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. But you got to go in and get it. You got to believe it. Oh yeah, there'll be giants there. So what? God says they're already yours. You got to believe him as you enter in. But here's the rub. You got to have the faith to possess all that is yours in Christ. And unless you're studying the Bible, you don't know all that is yours in Christ because you haven't read about it yet. Again, that's why we press it upon you to be people of the book. Be Bereans. Added to the fact that Peter's going to a little later on in this epistle tell you there's going to be lots of false teachers telling you what you're going to have, what you want to hear in deceptive terms. Oh, you you don't have to do all that. Just buy my book and do three easy steps how to be a wonderful Christian. Don't need to read the Bible. Just trust me. You got to be people of the book. If you partake of that grace and peace through the knowledge of God, you have purpose and meaning in your life. And you're one of the few people who have purpose and meaning in this world because we live in a world that's starving and dying for thirst and want for meaning. For meaning. It all begins as, and is as simple as ABCs. And again, as I think about these ABCs, we teach the kids this every year in camp. If they don't learn anything, our rule is they got to leave camp knowing the ABCs. Hopefully at some time in their life, whether it be in camp or years down the road, they won't forget. And when they find their life lacking meaning and purpose, or God brings about things in their life, they can remember those folks who told them. Now what was that? It's as easy as ABC. Agreeing with God that we are broken. Our imageness was fractured, twisted, perverted, and changed. We're all sinners. And then simply believe that God in His love did for us what He said He did for us. He loved you, even in your sinfulness. He died for you that your sins might be forgiven. He rose from the grave so that you might be empowered by the Holy Spirit that He would sin by the new covenant. To once again reflect that imageness that you were meant to have. And finally, you see, which would be the easy one, confess Him as Lord. Put Him back where He belongs. The boss of the garden and when he says, don't eat that, don't eat that. Because he is Lord of Lord. 
and we confess Him as that. If you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, confess Him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, thou shalt be saved. As simple as ABC, but we live in a world that is dying because they refuse to accept that simple message of grace. Let's sing as we, we close this morning. Please stand and turn to number 534, Learning to Lean. While you're still standing, let's hear the words of the benediction this morning. We are God's field. May God work in us to yield good fruit. We are God's seed. May we mature and find strength as we grow in the wind. We are God's sowers. May God increase our planting that it might be pleasing in His sight. Amen.